Good morning, everybody. This is Kevin Renaud with Peerless. Thanks for joining us for this, our third installment of our e-learning initiative. Uh, this morning, we're going to be talking about expansion joints versus metal hose. Uh, and we do uh, have some people still filing in, so we're just going to pause for one moment here while we get some more registrants in. We'll be back with you momentarily. Good morning once again. This is Kevin Renaud with Peerless, and we are going to get started. Um, hey, Kevin, this is Dan. Um, can't, can't hear you right now. I'm not sure if, uh, yep, there you go. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, this is the third week in a row and you'd think we'd have the bugs worked out, but uh, the mute button got me. So um, thanks again. Uh, before I turn it over to Paul Long with Hosemaster, uh, I'm gonna go through a brief introduction. Uh, we do have a diverse group by geography uh, and position and industry. And again, uh, you can see all the, the states represented. And once again, even friends over there in India, uh, industries, OEM skid builders, engineering firms, chemical, education, hospital, and manufacturing. Hey, Kev, uh, seems like the audio uh, went out again. All right, I don't know what's happening here with the mute, and I apologize for that, but Fortunately, you probably read the screen. Um, we do have three groups within Peerless. Uh, it's uh, our Procore group focuses on our OEM customers, skid builders, engineering. Uh, we do have our process group that works with our chemical plants, our pharmaceutical and contractor. Uh, and we do have a high temp division that works with uh, high temp insulation, refractory, scientific surfaces, and laboratory and medical. So Paul Long is with us from Hostmaster. He's a regional manager, um, and uh, we will turn it over to him momentarily. Uh, once again, Dan Morgan is our continuous improvement manager. He is going to be moderating and keeping me on track and making sure that my mute button stays in the proper position. Uh, Greg Barrell is our business development manager for the process group. Uh, and again, I'm the business development guy here at Peerless. I spend most of my time on the uh, Procore accounts. So before I do turn it over to Paul, we do like to start with uh, just a, a little known fact about uh, our presenter and today. Um, Paul Long has his own football card. So he actually uh, was the starting center for the Ohio State Buckeyes uh, back in the early 90s. Um, and there's a lot of people that have their own football card and you can see the roster here and a lot of people that he played with. Uh, and he was the starting center. So um, I started wondering what some of these, these football cards were worth. And uh, I, I got into a website and found that, um, wow, some of these things are, are going for some money. And I was wondering what Paul's might be worth. So um, on this very same website, I went to see, hoping to buy a Paul Long football card and it sold out. <laughs> so I can only assume that uh, Paul's is likely the most valuable among the group. But uh, anyways, I am going to turn over to Paul. Uh, I do apologize for the difficulties I've had with the mute button. Paul, you want to take it away? Actually, real quick, uh, this is Dan. Um, Kevin, we're going to definitely initiate a, a corrective action on that mute button here. But um, I just wanted to mention real quickly, I will be um, keeping an eye on things here in the, um, in the webinar. And we really want to encourage you guys to 
um, to ask any questions that you might have um, as Paul is going through his presentation. So um, you'll notice there is a questions panel. Um, so please feel free at any point to just send out a question. I'll be keeping an eye on it and I will be either, you know, ideally I'll be able to answer it myself. Um, I will also potentially ask Paul so that you know, the group can hear the question and answer. Um, or we might uh, need to follow up with you after the um, after the webinar. So feel free to send them in anytime you want. We'll, uh, we'll hopefully have an answer for you. Um, so with that, I will then turn it over to, to Paul. Welcome everybody. Dan, Kevin, thank you for the introduction. Hopefully everyone can hear me and uh, I don't have any mute button issues on, on my end because it's going to make for a really boring next 40 minutes. Uh, my name is Paul Long. I've been working at Hostmaster for 24 years, regional manager for 21 of them. And today's presentation is going to try to reduce the amount of questions pertaining to when to use a metal hose or an expansion joint. Is one better than the other? And hopefully by the end of this, everyone has a more stronger understanding and a better comfort level as to which one to select for your application. So with that, so with that Paul, um, sorry, yes. I think uh, before you dive into it, we're gonna take a quick just a quick little measure um, just to see. Um, we're going to send a poll out here that's going to pop up on everyone's screen and we're going to ask you to, to give an answer here. And this is just a little uh, sample to see uh, kind of where you guys are at. And then um, hopefully, oh, uh, shoot. Sorry, that was the wrong poll. Um, <laughs> all sorts of technical difficulties today. Uh, so here is the correct question we wanted to ask you guys before getting started here. So this is a a question that um, at the end of this presentation you will absolutely have the answer to. Um, but we want to just take a quick, quick uh, poll here to see if uh, which of you uh, might know the correct answer right now. So we'll let this run for a few more seconds here and see where we're at. All right, we got some good responses coming in. And we will close the poll for now, and then we will find the answer later on in the presentation and, uh, and recap that. Thanks, everyone. Are we ready? Yes, indeed. Thank you, Dan. So Hostmaster is a manufacturing company that does most of its heavy manufacturing in Cleveland, Ohio. We have a almost 300,000 square foot facility with locations that fabricate in Houston, Texas, Atlanta, Georgia, and Reno, Nevada. We started in 1982 and we are still family owned and our founder is 88. And if we weren't going through what we were, we are going through in this day and age, he would still be coming in four days a week from eight to five. So it's it's hard not to love working for a person with that kind of work ethic. So wonderful company. So what do we make at Hosemaster? There are three types of metal flexible hoses that we manufacture at Hosemaster. Corrugated metal hose, which we fabricate and manufacture from quarter inch on up to 12 inch in diameter. Strip wand hose, which if there were any pay phones still left in this world, it would be that stainless steel sheathing that would protect the conduit or the wires inside it. We make that from an eighth of an inch up to 16 inches in ID. And expansion joints, which we manufacture from two inch ID on up to 10 feet in diameter. So when we're talking about metal hose and metal expansion joints, when would you use these two items? What would, would force you or push you or drive you to use one of these components in your plant, uh, in a piping system or other? 
So first and foremost, temperature extremes. It has to be at a temperature where other components can't work, such as rubber or elastomers. Then we have chemical compatibility. The media that's going through that device or that flexible component has to be compatible or the alloy of the hose has to be compatible with that media. Permeation concerns. So if we worry that there's a gas that may be hazardous, such as chlorine going through a hose, we wanna make sure that what it's going through can contain it. Potential for catastrophic failure. With a metal hose, you're always going to have a fitting that is welded to the end of that hose. Abrasion or overbending concerns, because we are making these components out of a metal, uh, they're more robust uh, and they handle abrasion sometimes better than other potential hoses. Fire safety, once again, goes back to these components being made out of metal. We can go from cryogenic applications on upwards to 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. Certainly our largest consumer of our product would be the steel industry, the steel making industry. Achieving full vacuum, number seven. If you're going to pull a full vacuum through a metal hose or an expansion joint, the hoop strength of those convolutions in that hose or expansion joint are strong enough to not collapse when seeing a vacuum. And then just the flexibility and the fittings that you can weld to the end of the hose. So it would be very, very ugly to see, but if somebody wanted us to weld a quarter inch male MPT fitting on the end of a 12 inch hose, we could do so by using a reducer um, and get that accomplished. So whether somebody's making a fitting in a garage or we need to step down or step up a fitting in order to attach it to a metal hose, we can accommodate that because we are welding those fittings together. So when to use a metal hose or an expansion joint? We can kind of see here where this hose doesn't look probably the way it came out of Peerless or Hosemaster. The next photo is similar, but a larger diameter. So we have a hose, braid on the outside, fittings, tight space, but the braid is a little bit bulged away. Here, to restrain the piping system from moving in either direction, this customer decided to use tie rods and put nuts on them so that hose wouldn't have the ability to move. And the funny part about it is that hose is designed to move just by its manufacturing and, and design. And unfortunately, when a hose isn't used in the right manner, we have what we show on this photo is a graveyard of hoses that have failed over time due to misuse or misapplication. So hopefully, as we go through this in the end, uh, everyone will get a clear um, road of when to use which item for the application. So going to the metal hose first, Hosemaster uses a manufacturing process called hydroforming. We bring in a strip, we roll that strip into a tube, we fusion weld that tube together, and then we inject high pressure water into that tube, expanding the tube inside a set of dies that start open at the beginning and then close throughout the process completing the geometry of the diameter that we are manufacturing. So this allows us to take a 100 foot tube and then manufacture a flexible corrugated 40 foot length of hose. And what I'm gonna to try to do right now is show you some samples that I have here by starting my webcam and stopping the screen for a moment. So hopefully I pull this off correctly. So hopefully everyone can see me now. Some samples that I have right here is the tube 
that we manufacture from the strip. You can kind of see if I can do this correctly, is you'll see where we longitudinally weld that tube together to create a liquid tight airtight vessel we'll take that tube slide it over a mandrel pressurize it with water expanding that tube inside a set of dies that start to close and completely form what we get as the finished product it's a corrugated flexible hose from a stainless steel tube. So hopefully you're back on my screen. Yep, looking good, Paul. Thanks, Dan. So once we have a tube, and bear with me one second. as I get back. So once we have that tube corrugated, we've made a flexible component that can handle gas, liquid, air, whatever it may be, we need to do something in order to increase its working pressure. And what we do is we weave a stainless steel wire braid to the outside of it. And what that does is, is that it not only increases the working pressure, of that corrugated hose, it restrains that corrugated hose from growing back into the tube that we manufactured it from. We can make hose in various nickel alloys, mostly in 300 series stainless, but we also can make it in Monel and also Hastelloy for corrosive applications. We have various styles. Obviously, we have a standard hose, but from that standard hose, we have styles that are more flexible for applications that desire that need. We have hose styles that can handle higher working pressures. And like I said before, with the Hastelloy alloy, we have hoses that are more resistant to certain chemicals in various applications. So there are attributes for a metal hose. Obviously, we need to know the pressure rating in order to select the proper hose. We want to know how flexible we need that hose to be because we don't know what it's being attached to, if it's going to be moving up and down, back and forth, those types of things are, are vibrating. We need to know that the hose we've selected is actually resistant to the media that's going through it. And then we want to be cognizant that it has to be economical to be used uh, by the customer. So on the pressure carrying, since it's one of the most, if not the most uh, important facts about selecting a hose, we have to know what the temperature is because that can have a result uh, as a derating on that working pressure. We need to know if there's dynamic pressures in the system. Do we have a water hammer effect going on possibly? Flexibility, we wanna make sure that the hose that's selected can fit and work in where it's being put and then chemical compatibility. Typically, there are four components of a metal hose. We have that inner core that is the pressure carrying, or I should say the conveying, the media conveying item of the hose. We have the braid, which is the pressure carrying capabilities. End fittings, you need to have an ability to attach it into the system that you're putting it in. And then we have braid collars, which allow us to weld that hose or those hose components together. This is just a cutaway showing how we do that attaching of the fitting to the hose. We'll take the corrugated hose with the braid and that braid collar. We'll weld that in what we call a cap weld. And then that allows us a place to put the fitting on and then do a secondary fitting attachment weld. So specifying a metal hose, obviously we know we have to select the right type. We have to know what type of end fittings are going on the end. How are we gonna put this and incorporate it into your system? Is it flanged? Is it, does it have male MPTs? Is it a 
hydraulic fitting, like a JIC fitting, or is it just a piece of beveled pipe that then the customer is going to take and weld into his piping system? So those are some of the things we need to know. We need to know the correct length from point A to point B. Fabrication options and that kind of, does anything special have to go on that hose besides just the hose and the fittings itself? Testing every one of the hoses before it leaves Peerless or Hosemaster is tested, typically under uh, underwater using air, but a whole variety of different tests can be applied. We can hydrostatically test a hose, which typically tests the strength, integrity of that assembly. We can test it with high pressure gas. We can die pen the welds on the end if that's a requirement. And then if need be, when it's going into critical service applications, typically using gas, we can helium mass spectrometer test that assembly. And we can define a leak rate that would be in essence, as an example, filling a thimble full of helium molecules over the span of 30 years. So it's a very, very small leak rate that we're testing to, but we can get there if that's a requirement of the application. And then we can also clean the hoses if that is also a requirement. So here are some basic assembly um, functions where you can see hose we can put it into a bend we can create what's called a dog leg where we take essentially two assemblies and we join it with a common elbow we can put that loop on the side so then it can move back and forth so there are all various types of installations for hose but the main three movements that hose will handle is angular deflection, lateral offset, and then if you have two concurrent movements such as horizontal and vertical, we can put that hose assembly in a loop. So now that hose can travel essentially in those two directions without damaging that hose. Hey, Paul, we have uh, a couple of quick questions here. Um, so first, we're, we're, we've seen a lot of, of imagery here um, in diagrams and both actual photographs where uh, these assemblies all have braid on them. Is that in and of itself an indicator that um, what you have is a hose or is there ever a case where braid will be placed over an expansion joint? So, um... I think it's, we've been requested once in my 24 years to put braid on an expansion joint. And when we tried to clarify that further, I don't think we could get to the end result as to why they needed that done for that particular case. Sometimes we can hydroform metal hose up to 12 inches in diameter. Once you get past that diameter uh, threshold for hose making, one could make, and we do, can make a bellows with the attributes of a flexible hose and then cover it with braid. And that can take us up to about 30 inches in diameter. So we would still call that a hose because we're using those same um, metrics in that manufacturing process up to 30 inches so typically we don't see that okay got it um and just one more here real quick um is there a limit to the amount of twist that a hose can handle easy question zero all right so so, so so torsion is uh if not and we're going to get to that. Torsion is uh, a very bad thing for metal hose to see. Since that fitting is welded to the end, it can't move in that rotational movement. So what we always, always suggest is that if that is the case, if that application is seeing that torsional movement, that we look towards some type of swivel joint that can be added. So that could take up 
that torsional movement rather than the hose. Okay, very good. Thanks, Bob. And here's a photo. It's at a steel mill underneath a furnace, and these are eight-inch assemblies, um, and I think they're right around 45 feet in length. So typically, what this photo is trying to drive home is that metal hose is typically used when we have a long length or distance to make up from point A to point B. It's in uh, an environment that you are required, or frankly, it's the only thing you can use, meaning metal hose, due to the temperature, what's going through the hose, what's affixed to the end of that hose. So here's a nice A loop where these assemblies are going up when the furnace is tilted and then coming back down and they're feeding water to it, controlling the temperature of that furnace. So this dovetails nicely into that torsion question, but when metal hoses are used in a facility, if you want to put together some type of PM survey, whether it's quarterly, bi-yearly, or yearly, some things to look for that are important are broken and missing braid wires because once again, those or that braid is the pressure carrying member of that hose. Without it, you're looking at whatever that unbraided hose is rated to. Typically, let's call it right around 70 PSI or less. So once that braid is damaged in any way, you start reducing that. So torsion, also we wanna make sure that we're using something else to be able to take over for that torsion. Bending the hose directly behind the braid collar. We wanna make sure that you're using the whole entire length of that hose to make whatever bend you need to make. Axial compression, and we'll get to that with expansion joints, but if you put a 15 inch metal hose in a 13 inch window and it's horizontal, you're going to need to compress that hose. And what happens is, is that the convolutions on the inside of that hose allow you to do that. But what happens to the braid is, is that it bulges away and it leaves that hose unsupported. So that's what we saw in all of those pump connectors in the first few slides of this. We wanna make sure that we support sagging or unsupported hose ins installations if need be. And then we wanna look at the OD appearance of that hose. Is there any residue on the outside of that hose in any way? So just taking a quick visual. A nice rule of thumb when trying to specify a metal hose or an expansion joint is the stamped acronym, size, temperature, application, media, pressure. You need to know the end fittings and then dynamics of that application. And here's a photo where metal hose is probably not the right animal to fit inside this piping system. So they, they either pulled some hoses out of their storeroom or bought them uh, thinking that they could make a nice radius or bend with the hose. And unfortunately, they're not only compressing the hose, looks like there's some torsion involved with that installation. So probably not the best fit for a metal hose. And here we go with the axial compression. So once that yeah, so just uh, Paul, real quick before uh, before you actually get into the answer, just to recap our results, fifty five percent of our poll participants did accurately um, answer the question that axial movement is what a metal hose cannot handle. So pretty uh, pretty decent job there. Fantastic. And rolling into expansion joints. So there is an association called EDGMA, the Expansion, Jan uh, Expansion Joint Manufacturers Association, and they define an expansion joint as any device containing one or more bellows used to absorb dimensional changes such as those caused mostly by thermal expansion or contraction of a pipeline, duct, or vessel. 
And just to bury that point home with the ax axial movement, that's why it's circled on this page. It's the one movement that expansion joints can handle that metal hose cannot. However, we can manufacture expansion joints to handle other movements such as angular and also lateral movement. So misconceptions about expansion joints are sometimes people say that they're relatively stiff. They have poor lateral movement capabilities. They're more expensive than a pump connector or metal hose. And they don't dampen vibration like other components can. But in reality, if it's relatively stiff, it just means that we don't have the right set of data points to design something better suited for the application that they have, which we can do by using multiple plies in an expansion joint, and I'll touch on that in a second. Poor lateral movement, well, we can join bellows together with a spool piece of pipe called a universal expansion joint, most commonly, and now we can handle larger lateral movements. More expensive, expansion joints do have the possibility of being more expensive than a metal hose. However, we're designing that expansion joint to last for years whereas a metal hose may give it up its life in a year's worth of time, or if not sooner, if it's not being used properly. And then going back to the multiple ply uh, expansion joint route, we can use multiple plies to off also dampen vibration. This slide is just showing what a multiple ply expansion joint can do that a hose can't. So on a hose, we're manufacturing that hose from a single strip of 300 series stainless. Most often we roll that into a tube and we form the hose from the tube. In the expansion joint world, we're manufacturing expansion joints typically from sheet material that we do form into a tube, but since Typically, expansion joints or shorter or typically not longer than three times this idea as a rule of thumb, not always. We can then make multiple tubes and then nest those tubes inside of one another and then form the bellows or convolutions into those multiple tubes all at one time, creating a multiple ply expansion joint that can handle vibration better is easier to move or has a lower spring rate. And then it drastically incre increases the cycle life of that part. So as you can see where one ply of material may have a cycle life of 542, three plies were almost at 87,000 cycles. And a cycle is uh, defined as if we have one inch of lateral offset, it would be the deflection to that one inch of lateral offset and then back to neutral again would be one full cycle. We can design expansion joints up to a hundred million cycles, which we have in the past. And whereas a metal hose may last six months in an application, we've designed expansion joints to far exceed that into five, 10 years in an application. So metal hose, we have several different styles depending upon what application we need to solve. In the expansion joint world, we have different styles of designs that we can select for the particular application. The most typical is at the top is just a bellows with two fittings on the ends that can be incorporated into the piping system. We can put tie rods or limit rods on the outside of an expansion joint. We can add hinges to them. The universal expansion joint that I spoke about earlier, we can take two bellows components, weld them to a spool piece of metal or a piping to create an ability to achieve a longer lateral offset. And then there's a whole host of other more engineered items that we can do 
if the application requires it. So this is a photo of an expansion joint that we manufactured at Hosemaster. We actually made 20 of these and it's 60 inch in diameter and 20 feet long. So there's no way we can manufacture a metal hose to do the same thing that this can. So larger diameters, like I said, past 30 inches for sure. We're going to need to solve that, that application issue with an expansion joint of some kind. One concern that you have with metal expansion joints that you do not have with metal hose is uh, it's called pressure thrust. So with a braided metal hose, when you have pressure going on the inside of that, the pressure thrust is taken up by the braid on the outside. So the braid supports that inner corrugated hose from growing longer, elongating. In an expansion joint where you don't have that braid on the outside of it, you have other devices that you can use uh, in the hardware world, such as in this photo, threaded rod, where we can put bolts on the end and tack those bolts into place. So now we can control the actual movements within a certain amount for that unit. Sometimes it's controlled with hinges or other devices but we need something to rely on in order to handle that pressure thrust. Um, and, and it's a bigger, bigger issue if we don't know if a piping system is properly anchored or guided. We definitely need to look at putting hardware, some type of hardware on that unit. A quick little checklist on what to look for on expansion joints in service. Certainly we wanna make sure that we're looking for cracks in the bellows, fractures. Squirm, it's not unlike that bulging picture of the hose, but we can see that the convolutions of an expansion joint will be deflected or almost blown up. Leaking end connections, obviously the uh, appearance of the OD. We want to make sure if it does have hardware that that hardware is where it was when we originally designed it with all of these units there's a design pack that goes with them showing exactly how that expansion joint part was designed at the beginning where those nuts or hardware were set to so you can use that in your survey And then we also tag that part with all of the different working conditions, temperature, pressure, and then also with its design number. So we have several different specifications at Hosemaster, depending upon the applications. Um, just for instance, um, for chlorine hoses, uh, we abide by all of the Chlorine Institute specification guidelines in the manufacture of those assemblies. In the process piping world, we may be asked to conform to an ASME B31.1 or B31.3 code. Um, we also can manage and handle PED specifications if that is uh, a need, uh, which is the pressure equipment directive, uh, typically an ISO for the European community. It's like ISO on, on steroids. A uh, lot of checks and balances and paperwork, and uh, we are very well suited to handle and accommodate all of those requests. Industries that our products are typically found in, that strip on hose that we didn't spend much time talking about um, at the beginning, bulk material handling, the conveying of plastic pellets, chemical, petrochemical, pulp and paper, power generation, steel, power utility, a little bit in the water and wastewater treatment areas, but typically since we're not dealing with high temperatures or low temperatures, uh, or if we're not dealing with the corrosive uh, media, a rubber joint may be used um, 
in, in that type of uh, application. And then shipbuilding when needed. Yeah, so, so Paul, we, uh, we do have a few questions here um, that came in over the last couple of slides, so um, it's okay. I'll uh, start uh, firing them off here. The first one's uh, somewhat application-specific, so hopefully you, you got this one. Um, basically, the question is, what is uh, the difference in cost uh, between a gimbaled unit and a typical tie rod design um, that would be installed on the discharge pressure of an air compressor? That's a great question, and <laughs> and of course you had to start out with the one that I I really am ill-equipped to answer. Uh, so what we could do is very easily design both of those units up and uh, do that in the proper manner with uh, a design then quotation and get that information to them. Uh, I would assume that uh, since we're talking about a Gimbal, I don't know if the tide in the gimbal actually would, would do the same amount of movements um, as an end result, but I would assume that the gimbal would be more expensive just because now we're dealing with more labor involved on that unit as opposed to the one with the, the threaded rod. Perfect. Um, yeah, we'll follow up uh, post-webinar on that one. Um, okay, a couple of more here. Um, you may have covered this a little bit, but maybe just to reiterate, um, is an expansion joint or hose better for absorbing vibration? So if we could actually get the amount of vibration an application is, is seen, if it can be measured um, and given to us, we have a program that we can fit the number of cycles and the herd and the frequency and all that good stuff into our program and it could tell us whether it's past the point where a metal hose would work but what we can do like i said earlier with a with an expansion joint um and not with a hose is make it out of multiple plies so by doing that we can increase the ability of an expansion joint to handle vibrations better Whereas with a metal hose, we're really only using that one ply. And the only way you can combat vibration, or one of the ways you can combat vibration with a metal hose, is to make that metal hose longer and to put it perpendicular to where that vibration is coming from. Got it. OK. Um, one more for you. Um, can expansion joints? be pre-compressed uh, to help with installation? Absolutely. We can pre-compress them. And then what the one thing I didn't um, state during the um, meeting was, is that every one of our expansion joints will be shipped or is shipped with what we call shipping bars. They are tacked onto the end fittings of that unit or whatever needed so that when that is shipped from hose master to wherever it's going it doesn't go down the road essentially losing cycles as it moves back and forth in whatever uh, vehicle it's going in so we can also do the same thing on that where we can pre-compress the unit tack those shipping bars in place so that then it can be installed they can be released and then the unit will go to where it's designed as far as that length. Okay, very good. Um, one more here. Are there any uh, rules of thumb as far as how short a hose assembly can, can be? So, I, I mean, it's it's a very, um, uh, the rule of thumb. I was using the, the three times shorter than the ID for, for an expansion joint. It's kind of hard with a metal hose to say, hey, a metal hose should be three times longer than its ID. Uh, typically, you can consult um, Peerless or Hosemaster, and, and we have what's called uh, a length for normal vibration. It's different for every diameter because as the diameter changes, the number of convolutions per inch or per foot changes. So 
there is a limit to where you get down to if the hose is short enough essentially what you're doing is putting in a piece of pipe because there's not enough convolutions in that hose to actually accept any movement okay perfect um all right one more for you and then we'll turn it over to kevin uh so could you maybe give an example or guideline as to when um, a liner might need to be installed um, in either a, a hose or an expansion joint? So uh, right off the bat, there would be two reasons for a liner. First and foremost would be the velocity of the media that's going through that hose or an expansion joint. And that velocity, uh, it's a higher rating for a metal hose, uh, typically 150 uh, feet per second going through a metal hose. You would require a liner after that so it can handle it and, and not see any adverse effects with the velocity. For an expansion joint, that is greatly reduced um, down to the teens of feet per second. And it also depends on the length of what that expansion joint is but liners can be used in both applications uh, to um, alleviate that issue with velocity going through. The second reason, not only the velocity of the air or the media going through it, but if it has suspended solids in that media, whether it be a liquid with a granular type of media going through it that might be abrasive, or if we don't want something collecting inside the convolutions, liners are good items to use in those cases to uh, to eliminate that issue. Perfect, thanks. Uh, okay, at this point, I'm gonna turn this back over to Kevin uh, to wrap us up here, um, but please do keep the questions coming um, and we will, you know, we, we'll, we'll try to answer those uh, after the webinar. So um, feel free to keep sending them in. All right, Kevin. Thank you, Dan. Uh, are you switching it back to me? Yes. Perfect. All right. Um, yeah. Thanks again, everybody. I do want to just drive home a couple of points that Paul made, and Paul, we really appreciate it. One uh, being the design packet you had mentioned um, uh, about how to compare that with what might be in the facility, and 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 you can see in this right here, these drawings actually come as part of the design packet uh, with any expansion joint, uh, where it calls out all the bill of materials, all the design analysis is complete with that, and again, that comes with every quote. Um, and as far as the importance of making sure that it's built right, there is a specification sheet with all the information that would be required uh, that would allow any manufacturer to accurately build uh, to your specific design parameters. Uh, again, that's available uh, easily if, with an email. Um, and finally, Paul, I know you, you, you boast sometimes of your forensic analysis capabilities there in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, if there is a problem application out in your facility where you can't figure out what is uh, reducing the cycle life, um, they do have the ability to take it back to their uh, facility, reverse engineer it, figure out where that leak or problem areas might be occurring uh, in an effort to not have you keep replacing hoses, but find out where the problem is and um, improve upon that. Uh, Paul, is that still um, alive and kicking? It, it is, and thanks for pointing that out, Kevin. Uh, so this is a, a, a no charge service that we provide to our, our distribution, um, and it is to be uh, uh, taken advantage of for sure, because we wanna, we design our, our items to last as long as possible. And, and that's, you know, how, how we started our company back in 1982. So if there is ever a failure or uh, even if it's a product analysis, so you have an item that hasn't failed, but you want to see if there's any indications of wear, corrosion or other, we can also bring that item back and do that uh, evaluation on it. And if anyone has ever gone to a third party service, uh, you're well aware of what a third party service typically charges for some type of analysis in this manner. Uh, and it can be very costly. So we provide that uh, to Peerless, uh, and, and, and that's a partnership that uh, is live and well, and please use it uh, when you need to. Great, thank you, Paul. Once again, we do appreciate everyone's attendance today. Um, we will be following up with an email announcing the next um, installment of our e-learning initiative. 
Uh, in the meantime, everyone, uh, keep, if you have questions that weren't answered, we will be following up with those uh, as well. Uh, thanks again, uh, and um, we will talk to you soon. Everyone stay safe, and thanks for the support. Bye now.